So in this video, we'll consider some goodness of fit metrics for the Poisson regression model. Uh, in, in this video, we'll look at the deviance method, and in a future video, we'll look at the uh, Pearson's chi-squared method. And um, so generally, we can think about the deviance of a generalized linear model as negative 2 times the log likelihood of the GLM evaluated at the MLEs. So this quantity here is the deviance. And we have negative 2 times the log likelihood evaluated at. This is the MLE that we find through the, the maximization procedure. And then this whole thing here, uh, we've, we've seen in a previous lesson. But this log likelihood is just the sum from i equals 1 up to n of, in the case of the Poisson, it's yi times our estimate of the linear predictor. That's where the MLE comes in, right? The, the beta hats sit inside of that eta hat. So minus e to the eta i hat minus the log of yi factorial. So this is the deviance and if our modeling assumptions are correct a small deviance means a better fit. And this is in just the same way that a smaller residual sum of squares meant a better fit in normal regression. Right? If you think back um, the coefficient of determination r squared in normal regression got larger which meant a better fit under the model assumptions. Uh, whenever the residual sum of squares was smaller. So the deviance plays a very similar role in generalized linear models that the uh, residual sum of squares played in normal regression. And so there are a few special cases of the deviance that will be helpful in assessing fit and that are reported in R. And so I want to, uh, to talk a little bit about how those come about. So the first one is the null deviance. The null deviance is the deviance for the null model, which is uh, the model with just an intercept term and no predictors. So in this case, uh, we'll see that the estimate of lambda i will just be y bar for all of the, you know, all of the i's one through n. And I'll probably ask you to show that in a future homework assignment that if you just have this null model where the linear predictor is beta naught, then this should imply that your estimate of lambda i will be y bar for each of them. And you know that's analogous to what happened in uh, linear regression where we had no predictors. We had an estimate of our mean which was just the the sample mean of our response variables. Okay, so that turns our null deviance, right? We're going to think about the deviance that we just wrote down. Let's fill it in uh, with um, lambda i equals y bar. So we should have negative 2 times the sum y i a to i hat minus e eta i hat minus the log of yi factorial. So the first thing I want to do is write this in terms of lambda i hat because now we have a, a way to go from lambda i hat to y bar. And so this should be minus 2 times the sum of yi, and then we know that the log link function tells us how to go from, uh, you know, our linear predictor to the mean, and so that means that this should just be the log of uh, lambda i hat, and then we'll have e to the log of lambda i hat, so then we'll just be left with lambda i hat minus the log of yi factorial. And then the last step, I'll just plug in um, 
you know, this relationship up here, and that will give us the, the null deviance. So this should be minus 2 times the sum yi times the log of y bar minus y bar minus the log of yi factorial. And so this null deviance is reported in, uh, in the output of R, and I'll show you where that is in just a bit. <clears throat> Alright, so the next one I wanted to show you, not the null deviance here, but the, uh, the saturated deviance. And the deviance for the saturated model uh, is the deviance for the model where each data point has its own unique parameter. So in that case, you could imagine we would get something like, you know, quote unquote, the best fit possible. But of course, then we'd be modeling, um, we'd be modeling noise and not the structure of the relationship. And so we'll, we'll see how this saturated deviance gets used later on. But in this case, we would see that if we had a parameter for every data point, then we would just use uh, the data points to estimate the mean, right? We would have no more information than that. And so in this case, we'll have, you know, going back to the deviance and plugging in that relationship, we would have two times the sum of yi times the log. So what we should put in here is uh, lambda i hat, but that is just yi. Then we would have minus yi and minus the log of yi factorial. So this is the deviance of the saturated model. And the reason why I introduced the deviance of the saturated model is because we use it to construct the residual deviance, which is an important quantity and something that is reported in R. So again, I, f I forgot to change that. So this should be the residual deviance. And the residual deviance is just the difference between the uh, deviance for a model that you care about, and I'll call that DP, that's the model with P uh, predictors, P plus one parameters, minus the deviance of the saturated model. So we would just first write down the deviance of the model with P predictors. So that's the model that you have in hand that you care about, you think fits the data well. And really what the residual deviance is checking is how well does that model fit when compared with the, you know, the best fitting model possible. And so we would have minus two times the sum of yi times the log of lambda i hat. So that is the MLE that you find through the fitting process, right, through maximum likelihood estimation, minus, again, lambda i hat, minus the log of yi factorial. And then we're going to subtract off the deviance for the saturated model. And notice, if you go back a slide, um, that deviance has a negative out in front, so when we subtract, we'll actually be adding uh, two times the sum of yi times the log of yi minus yi minus the log of yi factorial. <clears throat> and then you can do some simplification, right? Um, bring these two things together under one sum and uh, use properties of logs and you'll end up getting something like the following. So you'll have a 2 times the sum of yi times the log of yi over 
the MLE of lambda minus yi minus the MLE of lambda. And so this quantity is, is reported along with the null deviance in the summary output of a GLM and R. And importantly, it can be shown that the residual deviance uh, follows a chi-squared distribution. And this is true more generally for deviances, but the residual deviance uh, will follow a particular chi-squared deviation under a certain null hypothesis. So under the hypothesis that uh, the P model fits the data, the degrees of freedom for the chi-squared here will be the degrees of freedom for the P model minus the degrees of freedom for the saturated model. So think about what the degrees of freedom are for that saturated model. They'll actually be zero. So here we'll see that this quantity will have n minus p plus 1 degrees of freedom. So sorry, that means that this thing is distributed chi-squared. Uh, with n minus p plus 1 degrees of freedom. So we can use that fact to construct a goodness of fit test with the following hypotheses. So we could start out with a null hypothesis that the model with p parameters, the one that we have in hand that we really care about, we can suppose that that one fits the, the data well. And the alternative would be that the model with p parameters does not fit well enough. And we can use the residual deviance as a test statistic. We know its distribution under the null hypothesis. We just said it was chi-squared with n minus p plus 1 degrees of freedom. And if we get a really large uh, value, that would cause us to reject the null hypothesis. So remember, the chi-squared test is an upper-tailed test. You reject just in case you get a large value. And what large means, of course, will depend on the degrees of freedom and it will depend on what you set your rate of type 1 error to be, your alpha. And so we'll go through uh, the practical application of this in some R code. And just to show you what it would look like, right here's some output from R. Don't worry about what the variables mean at this point, I just want to direct you to where you would see these deviances. So the null deviance down at the bottom and the residual deviance. So basically if you wanted to conduct the test that we just talked about, that test using the residual deviance, you would take this value, the 716, and you would try to find the area under the curve of a chi-squared with 24 degrees of freedom in this case, uh, area under the curve and to the right. And if that area, that's going to be your p-value, if that area is greater than say 0 0.05 then you would reject the null and you would think that I probably need some other model right the model with p parameters does not fit well enough so I would need something maybe more complicated I need more predictors for example alright so the last thing we'll take a look at in this video is how we would define the deviance residuals and remember residuals are important uh, in normal regression. They helped us out with diagnostics, for example. We looked at plenty of diagnostic plots. And we'd like to know, you know, is there an analog uh, to the residuals for GLMs? And it turns out that, yeah, we can take some terms from our residual deviance and think about them as, uh, as residuals. So in generalized linear modeling, the deviance, the residual deviance, plays a similar role to the residual sum of squares in regression. And in the residual sum of squares in regression, we were summing the squares of residuals. So it, one option might be you know, to go back to this residual deviance and extract something here that it looks like we are squaring and then summing up. So that takes a little bit of interpretive maneuvering, but you get this quantity here. right? So notice the square root because the deviance didn't have anything explicitly squared. So if we want to take something that we interpret, as, interpret that we are squaring and then summing up, we'll have a square root. And so it turns out uh, 
that since the residual, uh, the deviance for the residuals is approximately chi-squared distributed, assuming that the, the model fit is correct, and knowing that we construct chi-squared distributions from the sums of squares of standard normals, it turns out that under the right assumptions, whoops, this quantity will be approximately normal 0, 1. And so that's not always the case, but under the assumption that the model fits well and that we have like a, a high number of counts, we don't have most of our counts that are really small uh, in the response, then we have something that's approximately normal. And we can use this fact to check the fit of our model. Um, so for example, if, uh, if we construct a plot of these deviance residuals, against the estimate of the linear predictor. So if we did something like our di's against estimate of the linear predictor, and we see a nonlinear structure, that would be evidence of a lack of fit that might be corrected by additional predictors. So if we saw some, you know, some nonlinear trend, um, it might mean that we need to take into account some other factor.